Wondering what to do with all those kippers you stocked up on? Well, I've got an easy and delicious canned herring recipe for you that you're gonna love. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now the first thing I want to say is if at any time you want to jump ahead, be sure to check the timestamps in the description underneath this video. And I'll also have a link there to the printable recipe. Now I know many of you have shared with me that you really enjoy when I share the reasons why we want to eat kippers or any nutrient-dense food for that matter. But what I'm going to do first is make the recipe and then I'll save the nutritional information for the end for those of you who like the recipe first. Now in the beginning you may have noticed that I use the term kippers and herring because that's what kippers are. Kippers are smoked herring. Now, as we go over the ingredients for this dish, I want to mention that I know some of you have shared with me that you don't like the flavor of smoked fish or meats or poultry, so on and so forth. And if that's the case, you can go ahead and use mackerel in this recipe. And the mackerel that I'm able to find at my grocery store already has a little flavoring in it, which is nice. This is jalapeno, we've got lemon, and this one is sweet red bell peppers and black olives. You might have, this is a common brand, you might have this in your store as well, but know that you can use either the kippers, the smoked herring, or the mackerel for this recipe. Now, I'm gonna use two cans of kippers to make this because I allow one can per person, and this is gonna be for my husband and for me. Now, if you want to make this for four, six, whatever amount you want to make, you will just add additional cans of kippers or mackerel. And the cans of kippers that I have here are approximately three and a half ounces. And I think for the most part, whatever brand you find at your grocery store is going to be about three and a half ounces. This is a different brand. I've got here the Ocean Prince. I've got here King Oscar. And this is also about three and a half ounces. So I think they're pretty much all the same. And, three and a, a three and a half ounce can um, per person is perfect. But certainly you can add two cans per person if you want uh, for a more hearty meal. The only other ingredients that you're gonna need is some rice. And I've got this cooking right here in my rice cooker. And I have made this with chicken bone broth, butter, and sea salt. So hopefully through those three extra ingredients, as opposed to just going with water, I'm adding a lot of nutrition. The other ingredients that you're going to need is a bunch of parsley. I've got the flat leaf Italian parsley here. And you're going to want a lemon. And we're going to use the whole lemon. And the other thing that you're going to want is something in the onion family. I have a shallot here. Uh, you could also use green onions if you want. You could use red onions, white onions, whatever you have. But, some, but shallots and red onions, something like that, just give a nice pop of color. Uh, so, but any type of onion flavoring will be perfect. And the only other ingredient that you're gonna need is some olive oil. And I'm using an extra virgin olive oil, and yes, it's from a Texas olive ranch. I think it's very cute how in Texas, they don't say olive grove, they say olive ranch. Seems very appropriate to Texas. And the only other ingredients that you might need are a little bit of salt and pepper. Although kippers and mackerel, they tend to have some nice salting in them already when they come out of the can. Uh, but if you want additional salt and pepper, you can certainly add it to taste. For now, we're just gonna set the kippers aside and we're gonna go ahead and make the topping. How this dish shapes up is that you're gonna put your rice in a bowl, you're gonna put your kippers on top, and I'll show you how you can put the kippers right from the can or if you wanna warm them, either way is fine. And then you're going to top this with a nice mixture that's something somewhere between a gremolata and a chimichurri. And if those terms are new to you, all they really are are flavor boosters. They usually involve parsley or cilantro, garlic, onions, lemon, olive oil, things like that. The gremolata tends to be a little drier without the olive oil, and the chimichurri tends to have a little bit more of a sauce feel to it. So we're gonna make this mixture, this flavor booster, that's a wonderful complement to kippers or mackerel. Both of those canned fishes are very rich foods. They're very rich nutritionally, which we'll talk about later, but they're also very rich in their mouthfeel. 
And so having something that sort of lightens it and brightens it, that has some parsley, some lemon, a little olive oil, really helps sort of just boost, as I said, they're flavor boosters, these type of toppings. And it helps bring all the best flavors together and create something that's exceptionally tasty. And that's what makes these flavor boosters so helpful, especially if you're trying kippers for the first time, or if you think maybe in the past you didn't really like kippers. Making something with a flavor booster can often completely change the profile of the dish, and suddenly you find, wow, I really like this, just as you have uh, with the sardine recipe. Well, I've washed my parsley here, and I just have one bunch. Now, this is going to make more of a flavor booster, more of a gremolata chimichurri mixture than uh, what two people would need. But the nice thing about this, this will last about a week in your fridge, and you top this onto anything, chicken, uh, fish, anything savory, and maybe a, a nice piece of uh, grilled steak, and it's just delicious. And so you definitely will find that you're going to use this up if all you're serving today are two people. Uh, four people you may find you use the whole bunch, but uh, know that it does st store for about a week in your fridge. Well, as I said, this is washed. I dried it off with my tea towel. And even if there's a little water on it, don't worry, it's fine. Um, just make sure it's nice and clean and there's no uh, grittiness to it. Sometimes you can find that uh, to be the case uh, with these fresh leaf parsleys. Now, what I wanna mention is we're gonna do our best to cut off as much of the greenery as we can. And it's okay to also include the tender stems. We're not going to add in these tough lower stems, but don't throw these out. The next time you make bone broth, tie these with a kitchen twine and dip them in at the last 10 minutes of the simmer, as the last 10 minutes as the bone broth simmers. And that'll add a nice little bit of flavor. Alrighty, so I'm just gonna start doing like this. We're just gonna get off as much as we can. Now the reason that I'm cutting the leaves off of like this as opposed to just chopping it straight away is that these stems, even above the rubber band, are quite thick. And so we really want to avoid those uh, in the mixture that we're making, in the flavor booster that we're making. You can go ahead and just hand remove some extra leaves if you see some that look exceptionally nice. And as you're doing this process of getting the leaves off, if you come across a very thick stem like this, just pull it out and set it aside. Now what we're gonna do is go ahead and chop this fairly as finely as we can. But you wanna just do this with your kitchen knife. You don't wanna make a puree of it in a blender or in a food processor or even a mini chop, nothing like that. You want it to be finely chopped, but roughly chopped. And I'll show you exactly what I mean because you want it to have some texture to it. So just keep rocking your knife back and forth. And if you come across every once in a while amongst a, a rather thick stem, you can just go and pull that out. And just keep rocking your knife back and forth until you get a, <laughs> a small uh, chop, but yet, as you see, we're just doing it with our knife. It's just nothing fancy, nothing well calculated. It's just going to be a rough chop, but relatively fine. I'll put some up on the knife here. You can see the texture that we're looking for. This is perfect. Now we'll go ahead and get all of our parsley into a bowl. Now, you may be wondering, why doesn't Mary have some garlic in this? And you can certainly add it. Uh, I do recommend that you just make it like this the first time and see how you like it. I find that sometimes the raw garlic, because this is going to be a raw sauce, the raw garlic can almost be a little overpowering and kind of steal the day, so to speak, from all of the other ingredients and especially uh, the kippers. It, it, I feel it's just a little too much of a contrast, but make it this way the first time and then next time if you want, you can certainly start uh, with adding maybe just one clove of chopped raw garlic. Now I've washed and dried my lemon and what I'm gonna do is take a microplane grater and yeah, any fine grater you have like this will work great and we're gonna zest the lemon because we wanna get all the essential oils to be released into our sauce from the lemon zest. 
And this, this is always one of my favorite jobs. The aroma is amazing. And just do the best you can to get off as much of the zest you can. We're gonna leave the pith behind. That's the white part. That's why if you're wondering why I keep checking, I wanna make sure that I'm just getting the zest and not the pith. Now that we've zested our lemon, we're gonna go ahead and juice it right into our bowl. I'm just gonna put a strainer over the bowl to catch the seeds, and I'm just gonna use a little hand reamer here to start getting all of this wonderful juice out of the lemon, but at the same time, the strainer will catch the seeds. Now, after you juice these lemon halves, don't throw these away. I kind of think of these as the pith shells, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Save these for when you make various uh, natural type remedies. Uh, uh, recently I showed you how to make the lemon, ginger, turmeric ice cubes. Saving these and using these in that recipe will be perfect. So definitely go ahead and save these. Save them in a scrap bag. You can pop them in the freezer. It doesn't matter uh, because in that recipe for making the ice cubes, you're actually cooking the recipe first before you freeze it. Now what I'm going to do is actually pick the seeds out of this strainer and just put them to the side because I want to add all of this pulp, in seed free, <laughs> into our bowl. Alrighty, so so far we've got the parsley, the lemon zest, the lemon juice, and the lemon pulp in our bowl. Now we're going to go ahead and mince our shallot. If you're using a red onion, just find a very small one or maybe just half a one. I generally, the reason I use shallot in this recipe is you don't want to overpower it with a strong onion flavor. And I always hate when I just have to use like half or a quarter of something, and especially when it's onions, because they tend to be rather odorous in the refrigerator once they're cut. Uh, but certainly a little small red onion will work fine. If you can't find one, then yes, you just have to use a little piece of it. Uh, that's why I kind of like these green onions because you can just use maybe one or two of them and you'll be all set. Uh, also too, if you have a small white onion or a small yellow onion, that'll work too. Now I'm just gonna remove this outer skin of the shallot. Don't throw this out. Add this to your vegetable scrap bag. Uh, where you keep like your carrot peelings and celery, you know, bottoms, the bottom of the celery, the root of the celery, um, onion, other onion skins. Put your shallot skins in your scrap bag along with any other little scraps uh, that we have left over from the shallot. Those are perfect for going into your bone broth. Now I'm gonna go ahead and mince this. You want this to be a very fine cut because you don't want people getting, you know, like big chunks of shallot or onions, whatever you're using in their mouth. You want all the flavors to meld together beautifully. Now, once you go ahead and slice through your onion and then you chop it, what you wanna do is take your knife and you wanna run over the onion, just like you did with the parsley, just rocking the knife back and forth. This just helps to give everything an extra little bit of mince just in case your slices weren't as small as you would like them, or your, your chop, so to speak, of the onion. What didn't come as small as you'd like. Going over it with the knife like this gets everything nicely minced. Alrighty, once you've got your shallot into a nice mince, you're just going to go and put this right into your bowl. The next thing we're gonna do is just mix everything up that's in our bowl to get it all well incorporated and get the shallot nicely distributed throughout the parsley. And what I wanna say is you can use a whisk or a spatula to do this, but I actually find just using a fork works really well because you'll see what the next step is. And I think that just having a fork does the job. Next, we're gonna add in our olive oil. Now. How much olive oil you add really is going to depend on what type of consistency you want with your final product, your final flavor booster. I like to be a little generous with the olive oil, uh, but you can start with a quarter cup and then work up to a half a cup. But I would recommend that if this is the first time that you're making something like this, just start with a quarter cup. So all I'm gonna do is start pouring in my olive oil. I'm not measuring, I'm really just using my eyes to determine the consistency uh, that I like. But it, as I said, if you do like measurements, just start drizzling in about a quarter of a cup. And as you drizzle, just 
mix it in nicely with your parsley mixture. Alrighty, well I think I've got this to the consistency that I like. This is going to be perfect for topping on the kippers. So now we're going to go ahead and set this aside and we'll prepare the kippers. Now how you want to plate this up is just by putting some rice in a bowl. And as I shared with you earlier, I made this rice. It's being kept warm in my rice cooker and it's a basmati, but I've made it with butter, salt, and chicken bone broth. So hopefully it contains a lot of good nutrients. Now I store these kippers in my pantry, so they're room temperature and my husband and I enjoy them as is. But if you want to warm these, you really don't need to get all fancy with a skillet and all of that. Uh, you can just take these cans, put them in a bowl in which you've got hot water and let them sit in there for about five minutes. And when you open the can, the kippers will be nice and warm. What's also nice about most canned kippers is that they do come with these pull tops. Now, once you open the can of kippers, you'll notice that there is some liquid in there. I personally find it very tasty and I like to go ahead and pour it over my rice, uh, but you can certainly leave it behind in the can, whatever you want. The next thing that I do is just start to take the kippers out of the can, uh, just sort of flaking them as I go and topping them on the rice. Now you're going to go ahead and take a little bit of your fl flavor booster here and just go ahead and top this right on. You know, doesn't, don't worry if it's not artistic looking. <laughs> just go ahead and put as much or as little as you'd like. And then I recommend that you do taste it. And if you find you feel it needs salt and pepper, go ahead at that point and add it. And now this is ready to eat as is. As I mentioned earlier, you can add a little salt and pepper if you want. If you like another punch of onion flavor, you can add some sliced green onions on top. That would be very delicious. Or you could even use an extra squeeze of lemon juice. What I recommend is make it like this, taste it, and then see what additions you'd like to add. Now we'll go ahead and taste this in a sec. But as I mentioned earlier, I want to share with you why it's important to eat foods like kippers, as well as mackerel and sardines and anchovies, all these small nutrient dense fish. And that brings us to a discussion about what do we mean when we say nutrient dense foods? The term today is used very broadly and that's okay. But nutrient dense has a very specific meaning. And if you're looking for whatever reason in terms of health to supplement your diet with nutrient dense foods, it's important to know what that means. Often vegetables like kale, who's a real star, will often be referred to as nutrient dense. But technically, it's not nutrient dense dense, it's nutrient rich. It's rich in nutrients. It's rich in certain vitamins and minerals. But you have to eat a lot of kale. Kale, let's say per square inch, does contain vitamins and minerals, but you have to eat a lot of kale to get a good boost of vitamins and minerals. If you just ate one square inch of kale, you wouldn't be getting a lot of vitamins and minerals. So in that sense, kale is not a dense food. It's rich in vitamins and minerals. You just need to eat a lot of it. Nutrient dense foods, on the other hand, or the word specifically nutrient dense, means that there are a lot of vitamins and minerals, a lot of nutrients within a very small amount of that particular food. So if you eat a square inch, in this case, of kippers versus a square inch of kale, you're getting a lot more nutrients from the kippers. Other nutrient dense foods are animal organs like liver. A square inch of liver is very nutrient dense. It's loaded with vitamins and minerals and all kinds of important good healthy fats. So for a traditional foods diet, it is important of course that we eat nutrient rich foods like fruits and vegetables but we also want to make sure that we have sufficient nutrient-dense foods, true nutrient-dense foods. And they actually work hand in hand, synergistically together, because in order to really absorb the vitamins and minerals and the other nutrients that are in antioxidants, so on and so forth, that are in fruits and vegetables, we need the fats that are in the nutrient-dense foods to help us absorb those 
vitamins and minerals that are in the nutrient-rich foods. So I hope this explanation helps you on your traditional foods journey of seeing the importance of including both nutrient-rich and nutrient-dense foods in your entire traditional foods diet. And something that's wonderful about kippers is they are a nutrient-dense food and they're very rich in omega-3s. And if we've heard a lot about omega-3s, it's often related to the fact that they're very good for our health. You often hear of the benefits of eating salmon because it's very rich in omega-3s. But salmon sometimes can be costly, whereas these canned fishes, these smaller canned fishes, are usually extremely affordable. So they're a wonderful source of omega-3. And why do we want to make sure we have the omega-3 in our diet? Well, it's very good for our hearts and it's very good for our brains. So including a variety of canned fish or tinned fish, as some of you may know it, in our diets is so beneficial to us. And at the same time, it's easy on our pocketbook. So we're eating wonderfully nutritious, nutrient-dense foods, and we're not having to pay a lot of money for them as we might be if we were buying, say, fresh salmon, which is often reserved for a special occasion. And this makes just the perfect traditional foods meal because it provides you with nutrient-rich foods as well as nutrient-dense foods. You have the rice, which has been cooked with bone broth, butter, and salt, and the salt providing some minerals, the butter providing a wonderfully good fat, and the bone broth providing a rich source of gelatin, which is very soothing to our digestion, as well as helpful to the health of our nails and our skin and our hair. Then of course we have the kippers, which I've shared with you are very rich in omega-3s as well as many other wonderful vitamins and minerals. And then we top it with something that's nutrient rich, the Italian flat leaf parsley with some lemon juice and some shallot. It's wonderful. Plus with using the olive oil, we've added another layer of good fats. So just an overall wonderful combination of nutrient rich and nutrient dense foods to provide for a full traditional foods meal, one that's complete in everything that we need. Well, let's give this a taste and I'll tell you how it came out. But I wanna mention that no matter where you are on your traditional foods journey, definitely download my Essential Traditional Foods Four Corners Pantry List. And I'll have the link in the description below as well as in the pinned comment. That's going to be very helpful to you. It's 36 pages long and it's free to download and it shows you all of the foods that you want to think about considering having stocked in your traditional foods pantry, uh, which includes your working pantry, what you access every day, your fridge, your freezer, as well as your extended pantry or what we nickname the prepper pantry. And I don't leave you just high and dry with a list. I have links to show you how to use all of those foods uh, in different recipes, how to you know, create meals with them and so on and so forth. Plus a lot of other additional information about traditional, traditional foods. I spent a lot of time putting that together. So I think that you'll find it very helpful. Alrighty, now enough talking, right? Let's eat. Mmm, <laughs> mmm, mmm. This is so good. And I know that if you're new to Kippers and you saw me open that can, you were like, oh dear, I don't know about this. You've got to try it. It's so delicious. Trust me, try it and let me know what you think. And in the meantime, if you'd like more recipes for how to use canned or tinned fish, as well as other canned meats, be sure to click on this video over here where I share my number one sardines recipe and a whole host of other things. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.